In this video, we're gonna talk about muscarinic agonist. Muscarinic agonist, you can also call them cholinergic agonists because they release acetylcholine. You can also call them parasympathomimetics because they're gonna mimic what the parasympathetic nervous system does. So in our last video, we talked about muscarinic antagonists. So go ahead and watch that too to kind of get a feel for all the muscarinic drugs. But with muscarinic agonists, one of the most commonly prescribed drugs is pilocarpine, and it has several different indications. One, you could use it like an eye drop. If you think about what the oculomotor nerve delivers from the parasympathetic nervous system from the your westphal nucleus out to the ciliary ganglion, then you have the postganglionic fiber that releases acetylcholine onto the muscarinic top three receptor. That's gonna cause the ciliaris muscle in the eye to contract. When you have narrow angle glaucoma, you have increased pressure from aqueous humor, and this will this contraction of the ciliaris muscle will open up the canal of Schlem, Schlem and uh, allow that aqueous humor to drain out and it'll help the symptoms and help treat narrow angle glaucoma. So you can also take an oral form of pil pilocarpine and if let's say you have Sjogren's syndrome where it's an autoimmune disease that affects the, the exocrine glands, especially the lacrimal glands that uh, lubricate the eyes, the salivary glands, uh, the nasal mucosa, all that just dries up and it gets uncomfortable. Uh, you have to use a lot of eye drops, you might get halitosis or bad breath, you get dry eyes which is scleroophthalmia, you can get dry mouth which is xeroxtomia. so these, this can be real uncomfortable. So you can take polycarpine. Also if you had radiotherapy for head and neck cancer, this might be a good indication. You might, all those might dry up and be damaged by that cancer or the radiotherapy, the radiation. So we have the facial nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve. They carry aut autonomic innervation that's gonna um, stimulate the salivary glands. So uh, pilocarpine will bind to the muscarinic top three receptors and stimulate salivation. And then with the facial nerve, it can also increase lacrimation and, and then the nasal mucosa as well can, will produce more secretions. So pilocarpine is a muscarinic agonist and this is why physiology and pathophysiology is so important for pharmacology is if you think about what does the parasympathetic nervous system do. If you know that then you can think through the side effects conceptually versus memorizing them. So if you take pilocarpine our target is to get that increased secretions in the, in the, with salivation and lacrimation. But the side effects would be you could get a runny nose. You're increasing the, the secretions of your nasal mucosa as well. You think about it. What else does the parasympathetic nervous system do? It increases GI motility so you could get diarrhea. It increases urination so you'll have frequent urination. Um, it's kind of interesting. The one caveat for sympathetic fight or flight is that it releases norepinephrine and epinephrine every time on this uh, postganglionic fiber, except with sweat glands. Sweat, anytime you have a secretion, you have these M3 receptors that it's, a, it's a acetylcholine driven thing. So secretions through exocrine glands is gonna always have acetylcholine as its neurotransmitter. So you'll have increased sweating as well. So that's kind of the, what you have to think about. We have these targets, but it's gonna affect all the uh, muscarinic receptors throughout the body. And so, Another direct acting, these are direct acting muscarinic agonists because they actually bind to the muscarinic top three receptor and mimic what acetylcholine does. So bethanicol is another one. Uh, the indications for bethanicol would be post-op ileus. A lot of times when people have some kind of abdominal surgery, once, you know, they may go a week without a bowel movement. So you can take bethanicol stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, get that peristalsis and everything going, the gastric acid, all that going, and um, try to get uh, things moving along there. Uh, gastroparesis with diabetes mellitus. Sometimes people, uh, they'll have um, calm just kind of sitting in their stomach. It doesn't keep moving. And so you can give it a little bump with bethanicol. Urinary retention. So if someone have, is having trouble getting the urine out, maybe, um, there's all kinds of reasons for that, so bethanicol could be indicated for that as well. So those are direct acting. Now let's look at indirect acting 
muscarinic agonist, and these work as acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. So we know acetylcholine is always released onto that muscarinic top three and other muscarinic receptors. It's also released at the neuromuscular junction. So if you think about the disease myasthenia gravis, an autoimmune disease where antibodies will destroy the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors on the muscle sarcolemma or the cell membrane of the muscle. So you're having plenty of acetylcholine being released by the, the alpha motor neuron into the synaptic cleft, but you're not getting the binding to the receptors like you should because there's just not enough of them. So if you take acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, it'll keep that acetylcholine out in that synaptic cleft longer so it can find more of those receptors that are available and you can get a stronger muscle contraction. So once acetylcholine is released, normally acetylcholine esterase will come in, break it down into acetate and choline and, and eliminate its function at that point. But if you can keep that out there a little longer, you have more time to find the receptors that are available and get a stronger contraction. So that, uh, the main drug that's used prescribed for myasthenia gravis is pridostigmine. Another one's neostigmine. This pridostigmine just has a longer half-life, so for long-term management, it's a better drug. Now, we have a group of neurons in the basal forebrain called the basal nucleus of Maynard and they release acetylcholine, so they're cholinergic. And they release acetylcholine into, um, it's kind of a, a projection all through the cerebral cortex. And this plays a big role in our cognition, memory, learning, uh, all kinds of different interactions there. So these neurons preferentially get, uh, uh, degenerate with Alzheimer's dementia. So, what you can do is you can take an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. In this case, imagine now that we're in the brain and we just don't have many of these neurons, so we need to get the most effect that we can with the little bit of acetylcholine that we're making. So the number one drug that is prescribed for uh, Alzheimer's dementia is called Donepazil, and its brand, brand name is Aricept. And this doesn't slow down the disease process. It doesn't... Um, have any function other than just temporary symptomatic relief. And so what it does is, you know, you just don't have as much acetylcholine being released. So what little you have being released, if you give it more time to interact with the receptors, you can have a more pronounced effect from that little acetylcholine. So um, rivastigmine, galantamine, these are other drugs that can be used for that purpose as well. So that's just uh, some of the main drugs that are used as muscarinic agonists. Sometimes people take Botox, which will uh, prevent this vesicle from merging with the membrane and releasing its acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. So you end up with paralysis um, of the muscle. And sometimes you might want that. For example, if you have wrinkles in your forehead and you want to paralyze that frontalis muscle and prevent that contraction that contributes to the wrinkles. Or if you have cerebral palsy and you have some muscle that's in a spasm and prevents your functional function, you can kind of go to the other extreme and, and shoot Botox in there and, and relax that contraction to the point it's paralyzed. So it's kind of a trade-off, but you can see which one functionally helps. So um, I've also seen it. I had a Parkinson's patient and his toes would draw up into a spasm and it would always hurt. So he'd get injections into his toes and that they would relax and the pain would subside, but then his balance was a little bit off because he didn't have that same kind of grip with his toes. So it's, always, it's kind of always a trade-off and there's always side effects, but again, when you, have, when you use any of these um, muscarinic agonists, you gotta think side effects, what does the parasympathetic nervous system do, do what does it do, and then um, kind of think through that uh, conceptually. Thank you.